Good morning, Macedonia. Please stand, let's worship together. Preaching responsibilities. I'm here during the week. I'm here. To... If you don't know, if you haven't hung out with us long, 
uh, all of our pastoral staff uh, are bivocational. What that means is this church is not our full-time job. We work outside of this church. So the leadership of our church is very gracious and very wise to say, hey, we want the staff to be in this for the long haul. That's our goal too, that until I'm just too old to preach, this is where we are. Um, and so we take a break to kind of regroup and study. Praise the Lord, thank you. Yeah, we're excited to have too. So this is what's happened in the month of August. But this morning is a really special day. Uh, Tim Dowdy is going to be preaching for us this morning. And if you've never heard Tim, never met Tim, um, Christy and I, had we knew him for years. He and his wife, is, who's also, her name is Christy. Uh, but we knew them for years. But one Sunday in 2007, walked into Eagles Landing First Baptist to visit. And Tim was the senior pastor there for 31 years. Uh, and after that first Sunday of walking in and him getting up and saying, open your Bibles, and he began to walk through Scripture and explain it, we never went anywhere else. Uh, so Tim very much is still our pastor. He's been our pastor for 16 years. I love them tremendously. Uh, and you are going to be so blessed to hear his heart and what God has put on his heart to share. He now has retired, I guess you could say, from Eagles Landing. And he serves as the vice president of evangelism for the North American Mission Board. Uh, and so you're going to be thrilled to hear what God's put on his heart to share with us this morning. It's going to be a great morning. And as we progress through the month of August, next Sunday, Jason, our development pastor, is going to be preaching for us. And then the third Sunday of August, Kevin Hornsby, who's a member of our church, an evangelist. He has been down in Florida running youth camps all summer. He's back, and he's going to preach that third Sunday. And then August the 27th is Back to Church Sunday. And what that means is we've all traveled, we've all taken breaks, we've slept in, we've hit the lake. It's time to get back in church. Uh, so hopefully everybody will be here. I will preach that Sunday morning, Lord willing. Uh, we're going to have baptism that morning. Great time of worship. Ben's working on bringing some special guests back to be here that morning. It is going to be a great day that we say we're back and we're settled in. Uh, and then as we move into September, I'm going to start a sermon series called The Trouble with Christianity. And we're going to be looking at topics like the exclusivity claims that Christianity has, that Christ is the only way to heaven. If God is so loving, why do people suffer? All these kind of things that people struggle with in their faith, we're going to do that during the month of September. So it's going to be a great time of worship as we ramp up. And I'm thrilled that you're here this morning to be a part of it. If you're visiting with us, you are a special guest of ours. Uh, we are thrilled that you're here, and we ask really just two simple things. One is on the back of your message card, you can fill out that contact information, and as you leave, there's black offering boxes on each side of the room. You can just place that in there to let us know that you are here. The second thing we ask is that you come to the back where I will be there, Jason, our development pastor, Ben will come back when he wraps up. We'd love a chance to meet you, and our church has a free gift to present to you just for being here, and all you got to do is at least let us know you are here and introduce yourself, all right? So let's stand together. I'm going to read some scripture for us, pray for us, and then we're going to continue into our time of worship. And this morning, uh, when I was thinking about what Tim was going to be preaching on, I felt like it was fitting for us to kind of take some time in Revelation. So I want to read this to you, and I, I ask that you just think, meditate, listen to the words of God. This is one of the only things that is eternal that we hold in our hands. It will never fade. It will always be here. And listen to what it says. In Revelation 21, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of, from heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things have passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making all things new. And then if you listen to chapter 22, listen to what he says next. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. There will not need the lamp of, of a light or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign with him forever and ever. So it's a great encouragement about what awaits those who are believers and what Christ has prepared for us. So with that, let's pray. Father, we love you, and we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your love for us. And God, it is wonderful to think about what salvation has done for us. 
Not only did it bring eternal life, it set us free from our sins and forgiveness. It gave us the Spirit of God that now indwells us so that we can walk out our faith. But God, it gives us a promise that there is a day coming, Lord Jesus, where everything will be made new. All sin will cease, all mourning, no more crying, no more sickness. And God, we will see you in your glory. We will see your face and we will serve you. And Lord, I am so thankful, Father, that Jesus was willing to humble himself, come here, walk among us, be tempted in every way as we are, voluntarily lay down his life as a sacrifice for sins so that anyone who would believe on the Lord Jesus will be saved. And God, this morning as we worship you, I pray it is not something we just do because it's part of the service, God, but our worship will come from this meditation, the, the thankfulness that we have for what you've provided. Lord, I'm thankful for Tim and what he means to Christy and I, the influence he and his wife have in our life, and Lord, the way he consistently points to Jesus in all aspects. And I pray, God, that you would be all over him this morning as he preaches. Give him great energy, clarity of thought. And Lord, I pray for, the, for us as we hear that our ears will be open to your truth and the Spirit of God will move in the life of your people. And God, that we would forever be changed by what we hear and experience today. And may it all be for the great and glorious name of our King, Lord Jesus. We pray it in his name. Amen. All throughout my history Your faithfulness has walked beside me The winter storms made way for spring In every season from where I'm standing
Let's sing this old chorus. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Let this be our prayer this morning. Open the eyes of my heart as I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high. To see you high and lifted up. Oh, shine. guys are doing well man it's been a a fast-paced summer and uh and i've been looking forward to this to be here today now to be honest, honest with you i've known um christian doug for a long time he made reference to that when they came to our church and then got involved in the life of our church and uh god used them in a powerful way to impact lives through teaching a life group on sunday mornings helping them be a part of a leadership team as we directed the steps moving forward and then um some of you i met a couple of years ago on Wednesday nights when uh, COVID had hit and a lot of things were going on in the life of the church and we gathered small group would be right here in the front and they'd be about sometimes six, sometimes 12, just a few of us. And we'd pray, study the word together and pray for God to do something marvelous in the life of the church. Now what's so great to me is how God brought those few people together with Doug and Christy and then Ben and Lori and built a team, and he's continuing his great work in the life of this church. And I just say to you, yeah, just say to you, it has only just begun, okay? There's a world of people around you that need to know the gospel of Jesus. He's put this church here for the purpose of being a lighthouse to the nations. To reach the nations starts with reaching your own community, and there are a lot of people around here that need to know Jesus, and so you have the privilege of doing that. And, uh, and my wife and I, are, uh, are honored to live right down the street. We live three miles from the church. Now, after being a pastor for my whole life, I always got up really early, got to the church by 6.30 in the morning to study and pray, just be prepared for the day and, uh, and meet with the staff and all that stuff. And then my wife would come along and uh, she taught a life group in the morning. So she got there early as well, getting prepared for her life group uh, for children. And so I'll tell you, those Sundays when I'm And uh, so we have enjoyed that, but I, I can tell you, it's, it's a privilege to be here. I'm, I'm so honored to be able to share God's Word. Let me just say to you um, and remind you, when you open up this book, you hear His voice. This book called the Bible. This is God's Word to us. And we need to hear it. We need to experience it every single day. It needs to take root in our lives and produce fruit that brings praise and honor uh, and glory to the name of Jesus. And so today, uh, we're going to dive into the Word again and, uh, and study together, and hopefully it'll be helpful for you to understand what 
what God's teaching us through his word. And so if you've got your Bibles, turn to Colossians, Colossians, page 1103 in my Bible. It's, so you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and then you've got the epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, okay? So just make your way through the New Testament, chapter 3 of Colossians, and we're going to look at the first four verses today, and hopefully uh, we can draw some things out of this text that really helps us be settled in this life. You know one thing I've, I found, um, by the way, when you think about it, life has been moving at a rapid pace. Um, ever since COVID, it seems like the world has been on shaky ground. Every time we turn around, there's a new drama unfolding. There are new things that are changing. People's emotions are high and low. It seems like people can't seem to get their balance. And I'll tell you this, in every test and circumstance of life, in every season of life, you need an anchor for your soul, something that you can count on, something that does not change, something that you can wake up, and if the whole earth shifts, you can count on it. And that is the Word of God. And there are a lot of places in the Word of God that help us, give us insights for having that anchor for the soul. Colossians chapter 3 is one of those. But let me just help you understand. Think about this. If you, if you uh, put your finger here, turn back to Psalm 46. Look over in Psalm 46. Let me just read this to you. Listen to what the, you, you'll, you'll remember the words of this psalm, but listen to what the psalmist says. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way and though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Do you hear what he said? He said, listen, even if the mountains slide off under the sea, God is our refuge and our strength. And this word is his word. And by his word, he teaches us and feeds our soul and provides an anchor for our soul. And I think Colossians chapter 3 is one of those places you can turn day in and day out and find encouragement for your life and direction for how you should live each and every day. And so I, I want to pray for us, and then we'll dive into walking through this text. Father, we bow before you today, and we just pray that you would be at work in our hearts through the work of your Holy Spirit. I pray for those that are here in this room that may not know you yet, yet their, their soul hungers for a relationship with the God who made them. I pray today that somehow through what we share and experience and study together, you'll work your work of grace in their hearts, and they'll place their faith and trust in you for the forgiveness of their sins, for eternal life as a free gift and heaven as a home. And God, I pray for believers today. I pray that you'd be at work in our hearts, that you would continue to teach us where our focus needs to lie, where our faith needs to reside, so that in all things in this life, you'd be honored and glorified in our lives. God, I just pray that you'd show up. You know our needs before we speak them. You know the needs that are deeply buried within our hearts. I pray that you would speak to those needs, work in our lives, and produce in us a life. Let me, let me just read this text. First four verses, chapter 3. Everybody with me? Y'all with me? You're in Colossians, chapter 3, verse 1. Paul says this, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. I think what Paul's telling us in this passage is, Man, in this world, there are all kinds of uncertainties. And we could all say an amen to that. Things that we think are certain and you can count on day in and day out, all those things can evaporate in a moment. But he says the certainties of heaven, things that are above, overwhelm the, certain, the uncertainties of things that are on this earth, and we can put our trust in them. Now, when you start walking through this text, it, the first word kind of sets us um, down this path. And we can read it in a wrong way. This passage says, if then you have been raised with Christ. He's not really talking about a possible condition. He's really talking about a present reality. In other words, for us in English, the word if could be the word since. Since then you have been raised with 
Christ. And that's the life that we have. It's a resurrected life. Because before Christ, we are dead in our trespasses and sin. But when we come to know Christ, we've been made alive. He is our hope. He is our life. In fact, when you think about that new life, let me just give you three characteristics of it that just sometimes I think we take for granted. Number one, it's a new life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed and the new has come. Isn't that good news? I mean, listen, when we come to know Christ, he makes our life brand new. He forgives our sin, cleanses us from our sin, and gives us new life in him. Second thing is, it's an eternal life. And uh, man, everyone knows John 3, 16, even if you're not a Christian. You watch baseball and you see the guy with the rainbow-colored hair holding up the sign behind home plate of the World Series. John 3, 16. You may not know what it says, but you know that's a powerful verse. And it is a powerful verse. John uh, records for us the conversation that Jesus is having with Nicodemus at night. And out of that conversation comes this verse, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's eternal. It lasts forever. In fact, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, the apostle that wrote the Gospel of John also wrote 1 John, and he says this, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. And that's good news. And then the third thing is this. It's a secure life. This life in Christ is secure. The world doesn't give it to you, and the world can't take it away. Isn't that good? God gives us this life. No matter what happens in this life, you are secure in the grip of his grace. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 1, he says this. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who's the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. In other words, God has you in his grip, and he's not letting go. Man, that is good news for us. That's this life that he's talking about. He says, listen, since you have been raised with Christ, you've been given a new life, then he gives us two imperative commands. To be honest with you, they're very challenging. He says, seek the things that are above. The word seek, you could circle. And then drop down to verse 2. Set your mind on, th on minds on things that are above. Seek and set. Essentially, he's saying the same thing to us twice. To make a point. Listen, you want to get this right? You want to get this life right that, you, that God's been giving you? That he's entrusted to, your, to you? Then what you need to do is you need to make sure that you are seeking the things that are above and you are setting your mind on things that are above in the, in the morning. And uh, man, you've got all kinds of things you need to accomplish in the day. You have to go to work. You've got to take care of your house, your home. There's all kinds of tasks. So much so that it's so easy for our vision to move from here to here and stay there. And Paul says, that's not where you need to live. Because you've been given new life, if you want to have certainty in your heart, confidence in your soul, if you want to understand how thinking about heaven can change life here on earth, this is what you need to do. You need to seek and you need to set. Now you say, on what? He gives us really three things in this passage. One, the time. We need to think about eternal things over temporal things. We get really caught up on things that aren't going to last, don't we? If you don't believe me, just listen to Facebook and Twitter, Instagram, all the drama that takes place there. If you don't have enough drama in your life, just sign up for a new account. I guarantee you the world can produce drama in your life. It's because we get so caught up in the temporal, the things that are not going to last. What Paul's telling us is, listen, set your mind, your heart on things that are eternal, things that matter, that will always matter. And then the second thing he says, things above. That's the place. Focus on heavenly things rather than earthly things. It's, ama it's amazing how much time and effort we put into making sure we get things on this earth right, like we like them. And we give so little thought to heavenly things. That may be why our lives are so much like a ride on a roller coaster that never ends. And the third thing is, he gives us the person. Four times in these first four verses, he mentions this, Christ. Jesus is the centerpiece. You want strength for your soul? You want focus for your life? You want to make sure your life matters? 
You want to make sure you're living life in the right direction? Then the centerpiece of your life needs to be the Lord Jesus Christ. That was true of the Apostle Paul. And he's telling us in these first four verses, four times he mentions Christ. Now, here's the question. With all the distractions, all the things that we have to do in this life, how in the earth um, recommendations for your spiritual journey? Number one. Saturate your mind with the Word of God. Saturate your mind with the Word of God. This book, the Bible. He didn't give it to us so we wouldn't read it. He gave it to us so we would read it. And when we read it, we hear His voice. And when you saturate your mind with the Word of God, it's amazing what happens. By the way, the word saturate literally means to be soaked. It means to be drenching wet. In fact, this summer, if you go out in the yard and you spend all day on a Saturday working in the yard, you will be drenching wet, right? That's exactly what he's been in this, and what I mean in this this statement is saturate your life with the Word of God. Spend time in it. For example, let me give you some some verses. By the way, I'm going to give you a lot of verses. You might just jot down the references if you want them. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of our God will stand forever. Is there anything in your life that will stand forever? God will. His Word will. You can take Him at His Word. One of, one of my favorite books of the New Testament is one of these epistles that we just blew by turning to Colossians. It's, it's the letter called Philippians. It's the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a group, group of Christians in Philippi. And as he wrote it to them, he spent a lot of time encouraging them. It's the book of joy. By the time he gets to the end, chapter 4, he gives them some final words to remind them of how to think, how to live, what to do. This is what he says. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. You know what? We need to put that on our refrigerator. I'm only going to think about things that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise. That would change the way we think, wouldn't it? And then verse 9, he says, What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, you say, what is pure, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise? God's Word is. God's Word is. Spend time in it. When you're driving down the road and still listen to uh, music or a talk show, maybe just listen to the Word of God. The God of peace will be with you. Listen, my commute to my office is 78 miles. Anybody top that? It's a long way, okay? I go right through the heart of Atlanta to Alpharetta. I hate traffic. My wife thought God was just having a good laugh when he gave me this responsibility and had to drive all the way through Atlanta in the mornings and all the way back home in the afternoons uh, from Alpharetta, 78 miles miles. Let me tell you something. If you listen to the radio and listen and watch the drivers around you, by the time you get home, you'll be um, a nervous wreck. But in the midst of all of that chaos, just listening to the Word of God, it brings peace to your soul. It reminds you what's important. Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2. Listen to this. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of mockers. Listen to this. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Let me give you another one. Proverbs 3. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commands, for they will bring you many days of full life and well-being. What I'm telling you, over and over again, in God's Word itself, it tells us, saturate your life with the Word of God. It helps you stay focused on things that matter, things that are eternal, instead of getting caught up in all that's going on around you. Second thing, associate the beauty you see on earth with the greater beauty that awaits you in heaven. In other words, you wake up in the morning, see a sunrise, man, it's beautiful. In this world that's not right, we know this isn't right. The fallen state of this world, everything has been damaged, but in the midst of it, we can still be the, see the beauty of God's creative work in the, in the world that he's made. But when we see it, 
We don't just think about creation. We need to think about the creator and what awaits us in heaven. Man, it's phenomenal. One of the things I like to do in, in the mornings is I like to listen to Psalm 19. It's just one of my favorites. Let me just read part of it to you. Now listen to what it says. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. You remember this psalm? Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? What I'm telling you is, listen, take some time to take in what God has made. And when you do, be reminded that what awaits us is far more beautiful than what we enjoy here. Third thing, meditate on the promises in God's word about the future. I'm not talking about tomorrow. I'm talking about forever. That's the future. Listen to this. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. I'm knowing throwing a lot of verses, but listen, this is God's word. You don't really need to know what I have to say, but you and I need to know what God has to say. 1 Peter chapter 1 says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through, a, through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. I don't know if you got the full implications of that, but it's, he's just celebrating what God's given him. He's thinking about what is yet to come, and he says, man, how good is this salvation that we enjoy. In fact, Doug read, read this earlier, but I don't want to read part of it again just to remind us how good heaven is. I mean, just think about it. There's no sin in heaven. You know when the Lord's teaching us the model prayer in the Sermon on the Mount? And he tells us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He really tells us in that passage to pray for the coming kingdom. And you think about that coming kingdom. There's no death. Isn't that good? Guy on my staff this week Godly guy, he and his wife have six kids. They adopted one from Uganda. From the day they got him home at six months old, he was having physical problems. Last week he died as a 10-year-old. In heaven, there is no death. There is no sorrow. You ever get overwhelmed with grief? There is no worry. You people that have come so accustomed to worrying every day of your life, you're going to know what freedom is really all about in heaven. I'm not a big worrier. Some, there's some things I worry about. But some people are just dominated. There's no worry in heaven. No goodbyes. No sadness. No envy. No jealousy. All that's gone. Listen to this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. I love that. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things that passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Man, praise be to God. And he said this, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. We need to spend a little bit of time thinking about what is ours in heaven. The fourth thing is, dedicate your life to prayer. Dedicate your life to prayer. Nothing sets your heart and your mind so that it'll be focused on the things that matter most, then spending time with God in prayer. You read the Word, you get to hear from God. You pray, He gets to hear from you. Open up your heart and talk to Him. You wouldn't need an outline on how to pray. Use the model prayer that God gave us 
or Jesus gave the disciples. This is how you should pray. Use that as an outline for your prayers. I do it every day. It's an encouragement to your own soul. In fact, think about this. Everyone knows the passage in Ephesians 6 because Paul outlines for us the armor of God that we're to wear. But in the, in the, lost in the shuffle is what he tells them at the end of this. Listen to this. He says, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And listen to this, verse 18. Praying at all times in the Spirit. He's not talking about with tongues. Listen, when we approach God as our Father, we pray in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And he says in this passage, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication, reminding us that we need to pray. Charles Carter was the pastor at, at First Baptist Jonesboro for probably nearly 30 years. I don't know how long. I met him when I was in my 20s, gone to Eagles Landing. Our church name was Koinonia. At the time, if you remember that story, and uh, in 1990, we changed the name to Eagles Landing, but I, I developed a friendship with Dr. Carter. Even though he was a very reserved person, he was an excellent leader and pastor and a godly man and a great, great encourager to me. Dr. Carter's now in his 80s, and uh, I hadn't seen him in a long time, and I was preaching down in South Georgia. A pastor that was on staff at Jonesboro um, got in a conversation with him about Dr. Carter, and he said, hey, I talked to him the other, the other day. And he said, I, I asked him, Dr. Carter, if you could do one thing different in your ministry, what would you do? Now listen, what would you do differently? Dr. Carter was a meticulous student of God's Word. In fact, he hand-wrote his sermons out on onion skin paper in about number eight font. It was tiny. He would trim the edges of the, of the paper and stick in his Bible so it looked just like the pages that were in his Bible. And this is what he said. He said, I would pray more and study less. Now, that's coming from a man who's lived his whole life devoted to Jesus and as he gets to the end of it and reflects over his life, he tells us, listen, here's what I would do differently. And what I would do differently is I'd spend more time in prayer. I've never met one person who told me in my life I pray too much. But I've met a lot of people who've told me I pray too little. You with me? We need to pray. And you say, all right, what if I do all that? What are the benefits? Let me just list a few. Okay? All that was the introduction. Now we'll get to the message. That's scaring some of you, isn't it? Like, what time are we going to finish? Well, we're, we're, we're getting there, all right? What are the benefits of this kind of life? Setting your mind on things above, setting your heart on things above, not on things of this earth. Number one, it helps us prevent, it helps prevent us from becoming entangled in the things of this world. So easy as believers to get so preoccupied with the demands of this life that we essentially become no good to the kingdom because all we're doing is taking care of our daily needs. That's not why we're here. Now, we have to do those things, but that's not where our minds ought to be set. That's not where our hearts and our affections ought to be set. We should be set on things above where Christ is. One day he's going to come again. That's a reality. That is truth. It's going to happen, and we can trust him. When we don't do that, we just get so entangled in the world that's around us. I'll give you an example. And I know I'm meddling at this point a little bit. During COVID, one of the most disappointing things for me during COVID 
is what happened to believers. There was all kinds of stuff going on. We had a health crisis. We'd never been through a pandemic in our lifetime, have we? We were getting messages from all kinds of places around the globe about this medical condition called COVID. We had racial tension going on in our country. We had political tension. It was like everywhere you turned, people were throwing punches at each other. And you'd think we'd walk inside the church and see believers holding on to the God who was holding on to them. And nothing in this world could shake them. But that wasn't happening. Churches were dividing. People's faith was distracted. We're more worried about sickness and tensions, politically or racially, than we were the kingdom of God and His mercy. What happens is, listen, when you set your mind and your heart only on the things on this earth, you just get entangled in every dramatic affair that takes place in the lives of men. And when you do, you cease to be effective as being the light of the world. See, I, I just believe that Jesus meant what he said. You with me? In one place it says he's the light of the world. But in the Sermon on the Mount, he said you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. And then he said, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Listen, if anybody ought to have certainty in the midst of all the uncertainty in this world, it is those who know Jesus. He made this world. He made you. He made me. He's brought us into his family. It is an eternal life, a new life, and secure life, and nothing can shake that away from us, not because we're holding on to him, but because he's holding on to us. Second thing is, it reminds us of the hope that's ours regardless of our circumstances. And if there's one word that marks believers, it's hope. And it's not, not that kind of hope, well, I hope that happens, you know. Like, I hope the Braves win the World Series. No, that's, that's not the kind of hope that he's describing in Scripture. It is a certain hope. It's in the midst of darkness, there is still light. In the midst of a struggle, there's still an answer. When, even when you're facing death, there's still hope. Um, years and years ago, my first mission trip, I went to India. And uh, that was probably not the wisest move on my part. We went to a small town called Kota, had a million people, not a paved road in the town. We went to a, I worked with a missionary named M.A. Thomas. M.A. Thomas had a pastor's school and an orphanage and doing great ministry in India. When he would preach, he'd wear a suit and no shoes. Fact is, he didn't ever wear shoes. And uh, I loved getting to know this man who had very little material in his life, but he was big in faith. And trusting God. One day we're walking down the street of Coda, just he and I, and we're talking, having a conversation. And um, right in the middle of the conversation, he says, You see the guy right here with the sword? I was like, Yeah. He said, He's an assassin. Now I want you to know, never before that moment, never since that moment, I've ever been in a conversation with somebody and they interrupted by saying, Hey, you see that guy? That guy's an assassin. So to be honest with you, while I'm standing in India, um, like 25 years old, and walking down a strange street, seeing this strange guy with a sword on his side, having the guy next to me say, that guy's an assassin, it just kind of stunned me. I said, how do you know he's an assassin? It's because he's been hired to assassinate me, the guy said, M.A. said. That didn't make me feel any better, okay? <laughs> if he's an assassin, he's looking for somebody else. There's a million people in this town. You can take any one of them out, but you don't have to take the guy out right beside me. He said, listen, one day I was walking down the street right where you are. He walked up to me, and he announced to me, he said, I have been hired to kill you, and I am going to kill you. I said, what, what did you do? And he said, I laughed. That was not my first thought, okay? I said, you laughed? He said, I said, yes. I laughed, and I said, kill me. Then I'll go to live with Jesus, my Savior, in a home 
that has streets paved with gold, gates made out of pearl. Beautiful, I will live there forever. So, so what do you say? He said, well, maybe I won't kill you. <laughs> and he said, and I laughed. I said, good, I'll just keep telling more people about my Savior Jesus until he takes me home. Kind of crazy illustration, but I just want you to understand something. When you set your mind on things above and your heart set on you have hope. You have hope. Third thing, it provides strength for living a life that's worthy of the gospel. Now, I want you to hear me very clearly. None of us are worthy of being saved. We're not saved because we're good. We're saved because God's good, and He's full of grace. When He saves us and makes us His own, changes everything for us. But it's not because we're good people. We're sinners. God loves us in spite of our sin. In fact, Romans chapter 5, verse 8 tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ commends His love for us. He saves us, makes us His own because of His grace. But once we come to know Christ... You and I are to live a life worthy of the gospel. Now, let me just give you some examples. Jot these verses down. Philippians 1.27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Remember, Paul is writing to a group of Christians in the city of Philippi, and he says this, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Make a mental note, Colossians 1. Same book, just back two pages. And so from the day we heard it, down in verse 9, we've not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Let me give you one more example. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12. We exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. What I want, I just, just wanted to make a point. I'm not saying something that's, that contradicts Scripture because I know it's such a, such a strain for us when you say, live a life worthy of the gospel. I can't live a life worthy of the gospel. Yes, you can. As a believer, when you come to know Christ, the Holy Spirit of God takes up residence in your heart. He lives in you. He's not in and out. He's in. And he's there to give you strength to live a life every day, whether you're at work, at home, in the neighborhood, with your kids at a ball game, wherever you are, the grocery store, live a life worthy of the gospel. Listen, when you set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, when you set your heart on things that are eternal, not on things of this earth, it gives you the strength you need to depend on the Holy Spirit to lead you and empower you to live a life that's worthy of the gospel. To do what matters most. I think one of Satan's greatest strategies to defeat the church is distraction. He gets us distracted with all kinds of other stuff in life. And we're, we forget that we're here to make much of Jesus. Every person that you encounter today out in the world, every single one of them, old, young, black, white, rich, poor, whatever nationality they are, every single one of them need to know Jesus because he's their only hope. He's your only hope. And God just put you in their path, not so that they could know you, but so that they could know him. When you focus on things that are eternal, when your heart's set on things that are eternal, it changes everything. Instead of fear, you have boldness. Instead of disinterest, you have great compassion for the people around you. So much so that you'll live a life worthy of the gospel. Now, here's the last thing. When you do what Paul's saying, when you follow his prescription for your life, it provides peace for your soul. <laughs> you know, during COVID, traveling around, talking to a lot of different people around North America, so many people were thrown off by all that we we're going through. A lot of people would say, man, I just can't wait till, you know, we're back to a place where we can be happy again. 
really wasn't happiness that they were looking for. It was peace. And you had more conversation, just wanted settledness, a peace in life. That, that's amazing, isn't it, when you have peace? I mean, it really is astounding when, when God overwhelms your life and in the midst of even troubled waters, you have a sense of peace. It's amazing. When you, when you focus your eyes on things above, not on things of this earth, when you focus your mind, your heart, your affections, everything about you on things that are eternal, he gives you peace. Listen to this. And I am serious. Jot this verse down because you might forget it. Isaiah 26, verse 3. Listen to this. You keep him, talking about the Lord, Lord, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Is that good? You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. It's exactly what Paul's talking about in Colossians 3. Now, some of you... Um, knew my dad, and some of you have no idea who my dad is, but my dad was an accountant all of his life. He, did, he didn't grow up in a, in a godly home. His, his, his mother was godly. His dad um, was a very wicked man. My grandfather died in prison the year I was born. Well, my dad got saved when he was a teenager, and he determined in his life his family wasn't going to be like his family. And so my mom and my dad both joined together to say, hey, we're going to teach our kids and we're going to raise our kids in an environment that loves Jesus and honors Jesus, even though we're not in a full-time ministry in a church, we're just in ministry of serving Jesus. And so I can tell you, growing up in the home I grew up in, I don't have any complaints. My dad was a firm disciplinarian. Okay? He didn't talk you to hope you'd feel bad. He spanked, I deserved every spanking I got, all right? But I knew if he promised a spanking, it was coming. It was coming. But my dad was also godly enough to teach me this book, teach me how to live a life that honored the Lord. When I became a pastor at Eagles Landing, my mom and dad moved to McDonough and joined our church. When they did, I was just so excited. I was so excited to have my mom and dad there. I was also excited, listen... It's like, you've told me what to do all of my life. Now I'm going to tell you what to do. You're a member of our church, yeah? That's just a joke, okay? Just a joke. Um, but my dad did the, um, he, was a, he was a servant. He came, retired. He came to my office and said, I want to take the lowest job in the church. I said, Dad, we're not hiring you. He said, no, I don't want money. I just want the job nobody else would do. And so he did. He took it on. He took out the trash, cleaned the floors. And um, very different than his secular work environment all of his life. The last 10 years of my, uh, my dad's life, he had Parkinson's and uh, ultimately passed away. But when I reflect back on the lessons my dad taught me, there are some historic moments. One of them was when I was learning to drive. 15, got my driver's license. I was so excited. We had a Vega. Anybody remember that car? Vega. Anybody tells you they have built the engine out of aluminum? Bad idea. Bad idea. It didn't go very fast, but it was a car, and we were glad to have it. My dad took me out in the Vega. We lived in a subdivision that at the end of the street, um, they added on, and so there was a bunch of streets but no houses. We were the last house. He said, we're going to go down here and learn how to drive. And so I get in the car, and... Um, my dad's already driven it down to the place where nobody is, just to be safe. And he's given me all these lectures before I even crank the car. This is the one I heard a thousand times in my life. Every time I left the house and grabbed the keys, my dad said, Hey, this is what he told me on this day. Put your mind in gear before you put that car in gear. That's a good one to teach your kids. Cranked it up. He's explaining everything to me, everything about kind of how to stay in the right part of the lane and how fast he wanted me to go and all that stuff. And, and I just wanted to put it in drive and go. 
And finally, it was time. Put in drive, we started going. And I was like, man, this is so cool. I'm driving a car. This is amazing. You remember that feeling? Incredible. So I'm driving along, and Dad says, okay, you got to check your mirrors. You got to check your side view mirror. You got to check your rear view mirror. Then you got to look at the front. I'm doing all that, and I'm just, man, so, so engaged, so proud of myself driving. I look up in the rear view mirror, and my friend down the street, Jerome, is riding behind me on his bicycle, and he's mocking me. He's making fun of me, okay? Now, I'm going five, so it's not hard to keep up with. I'm only going five miles an hour. This is my first time driving. I was just excited about driving. And so I'm just looking back at Jerome, and I'm like, okay, I know you can pass me. Go ahead and pass me. I'll run over you. I'm just, you know, I just wanted to get back at him. As I'm looking at him, though, all of a sudden, something happened. Boom. I'm up on the curb and into the grass. My dad, calm, sitting there. Of course, I slam on the brakes. He said, son... Let me explain something to you. He taps on the rearview mirror. He said, this is a rearview mirror. This is a windshield. (laughs) We glance at that, and we stare through that. And when you get those backwards, you get in trouble. That's what Paul's telling us. Things above, that's what you look at. That's what you stare at. This world, you just take a glance. It's the rearview mirror. And when we get those backwards, we get in trouble. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. And thank you for this life that you give us. Thank you for the salvation that we enjoy because of your goodness and grace. We thank you for the way you use us in this life to hold out the hope of the gospel to those around us. God, we thank you for your word, like it's recorded in Colossians chapter 3. I pray that you would teach us, ingrain in our hearts and our minds the fact that we need to keep our focus on you, on the things that are above, things that are eternal, not things on this earth. And Lord, may we find purpose and peace and strength to live a life that honors and glorifies your name. God, even in this invitation time, maybe some of us have gotten off track a little bit, gotten distracted. It's not uncommon. It happens to us all. But we just want you to revive our hearts. We just want you to draw us back to where you want us to be. And maybe just through the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, we just feel the need to come and make this altar our home today. Just kneel down and pray and say, God, be at work in me. I've gotten distracted, gotten off track for one reason or another. I just want to be yours. I just want to live a life holy and fully pleasing to you. Help me set my mind and my heart on the things that matter most, things that are above, not things on this earth. And use me to be a light to the world. Lord, there may be somebody here today that's They hunger for that kind of life, but they don't know you yet. As they search their hearts, there is a a void inside of them that's crying out, hungering for a relationship with the God who made them. And Lord, you're holding out your hand, saying, come to me, all who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I just pray today that they would feel the encouragement of your Holy Spirit and have the courage in their own hearts to come and just introduce themselves to Doug and say, listen, I need to know Jesus as my Savior. No, we're not going to embarrass anyone. We just take you aside, sit down, and explain to you what it means to know Jesus. And I pray today that they would experience the joy of knowing Christ as their Savior. Lord, your word's powerful. Your Holy Spirit's at work. I pray we'll follow you, and you'll be honored, and you'll be glorified. We give you praise today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing. Listen, as God's speaking to your heart, moving in your life, I don't know if you've made this a a normal practice yet. But Sunday's not just a day to hear. It's also a a day to follow. And God may be working in your heart, maybe stirring something in in you. 
It could be a number of things. And you say, what do I do? Well, sometimes we just put in practice when we're together what we need to practice when we're apart. And at the invitation time, man, this altar is here so we can get with God. And maybe you just need to pray. Maybe you just need to say, God, work in me. Or thank you for the work you're doing in me. Or maybe when Doug's going to be standing down here at the front, maybe you just need to come and talk to him and say, listen, I need somebody to pray for me. Pray with me. That's what Christians are here for. That's what the church is here for. We might encourage one another, the labor beside each other, and hold each other's hand so that together we can be the people of God and the family of faith. And so as we sing, as God speaks, we invite you. Make this altar your home. You talk to the God who loves you, saved you, made you his own. Come talk to Doug. Let God have his way in your your life. He will always lead you right. He will never lead you wrong. So follow him. Let's sing together. Things have passed away. Your love has saved.
We are just so glad that y'all are here this morning and were able to come and worship with us. A special thank you to our guests for being here. Don't forget to go see Pastor Jason or Pastor Doug in the back and get your gift. Now let's go out and be a light for Christ in a world of darkness. You are dismissed.